Okay, everyone. So welcome to the next installment of Project Pipeline mini-series hosted by Noma Pittsburgh. The first question we're going to ask is, what is urban design? Urban design, it's a design-adjacent profession. Many architects that are practicing also do some form of urban design or urban planning. Urban design, specifically urban design, we understand it as shaping the in-between spaces. And then urban planning is a slightly larger scale where not just a, an intersection or a specific site, it's more about the connection of different neighborhoods. But oftentimes when we hear urban design, people are using them interchangeably. Urban planning sometimes get referred to as urban design. When we talk about urban design, there are three parts. There's people, process, and place. And so the first section, when we talk about people, is understanding the public engagement process because the people are the center of what we're doing. We're not building communities here for our health. We're not building communities to just have these places. The places are built because we need them as a society. And so we wanna make sure that the public is involved in that process of designing that future. So who needs to be involved? We have a gamut of people. So when we talk about the core team, that's usually your client, the person who's paying you. There's usually a steering committee who are a group of people who are similarly invested in the future and want to know the nuts and bolts, but aren't necessarily the direct person that you are working with. Then there's the action teams who have different specific focus that may not encompass the entire design project, but these people are experts in locally or regionally in their area of expertise. And then finally is the public we often have multiple touches with all of these communities, but specifically with the, the public who may not have a designated expertise, but have a vested interest in the project and are, are invested in seeing what's happening and understanding what's happening in their neighborhoods. We have multiple phases in our projects and urban design projects. And so we use this as an opportunity at each phase of the project to have touches with all of the folks that we just talked about previously. So what, what are our goals? What actions do we want to take to arrive at our goals? What is the coordinated plan? Who needs to be involved in the plan in order to make those actions happen? And finally, a launching point for the project. How do we launch into action and get people excited about not just thinking about what to do, but the implementation of how to do it. During those touches with our public, with our experts, with our steering committee, we often create places and designing the process by which we can get the answers to the questions that we as urban designers need. So we ask people, what is important to your community? We tell them what we understand about their community so they can verify that for us. We ask them what, is, what are the important assets in your community so that we know what is sacred and what do we want to preserve and what do we want to connect to. And then talking amongst themselves as groups and discussing amongst themselves what are the important aspects of this because ultimately what we want to arrive at is a series of actions and a series of values that are important to them that will help guide us in the design of the work. But also what's important about the process is not so much what we, the interaction between the community and us, but just as important is the community's relationship to themselves. You want to build that coalition through the planning process of people coming together and talking to each other, saying, hey, I care about this too. We need to do something about this. Those are the moments that make the process so important because we can draw it, we can write it, but ultimately it's the people that get it done. The next is understanding place when we're talking about the design of future projects specifically. So, when we talk about projects and places, this is the hardware again. The beginning stages of planning the physical aspects are an analyzing the spaces that connect to natural and built exterior forces. 
So what does that mean? That's, that's, very, that's very kind of broad. Um, well, ultimately, we just want to understand what are the things that are important on, this, on the ground? Um, what are the physical elements that are important in place? And we simplify this information that we understand as urban designers through diagrams and drawing them. So we want to understand what streets are near our site or how does the sun come? What are the different places around these places that are important to connect to? So we typically do these diagrams using a combination of lines, arrows, and shapes that simplify the information. And so site analyses, if you go from urban designer to urban designer, they look very different because the site analysis is very dependent on what you find important. A transportation specialist, you might be more concerned with the bus system or are there trains or what are the intersections and what are the lanes, which needs another set or another sensibility in terms of what you diagram and how you diagram them. This is important because when you are designing, you design to the things that you notice and you respond to the things that you notice as well. So much of the design process begins in what you notice and how you choose to respond to the things that you notice. So there's a type of plan called a comprehensive plan, which asks you to do a lot. Based on the analyses that you do, they come together into a a kind of comprehensive design strategy that can address equity and environment as well. If you notice them all, you can respond to them all. So as an example for a project, we took a look at lifelong learning, which is understanding education and how education shows up physically and programmatically in um, the neighborhoods of Braddock, East Pittsburgh, and North Braddock. You have here, a set of high schools, libraries, basketball courts, playgrounds, and even the school district administration building all in one place. And so what we do as designers is to identify what roads are connecting these assets and make that very visible and highlight those connections. We can also highlight them by identifying additional parcels that can be developed that could also serve this programmatic need of education. And that can include things like gyms, it can include daycares, identifying the programs and also the places that these things can happen that can begin to make those links even stronger. And then finally, um, this is again going to the this, this, this shift in scale. Um, we went from all the communities to kind of a specific project area, and now we're getting into specific projects. And this scale is park design and you know architecture. Urban designers, although we're at a larger scale, can start to influence design proposals. They can start to bring in architectural designs and say how they fit into a larger context or a broader set of concepts about education. So here we have two projects that were made before this particular planning process, but through this process we're able to connect them to other assets and resources and plan for additional projects that will highlight these projects as important towards education. The next is process. And this is about designing policy, the software, not the physical. This is the social. When we talk about policy, it's important because oftentimes when we're asked to solve for a particular problem, even though it's place, when you get into the, the nitty gritty of what it means to have housing and housing equity, housing resilience, housing security, we're talking about the physical building, but we are also talking about demographic trends. We're talking about the ability to build wealth. We're talking about the cost of construction, the cost of maintenance and regulations, all in service to this idea of affordability. When we're talking about affordability, 
demand and supply. It's very economic. Market regulations, land use, those are very policy-based. Demographic trends and wealth building, these are about populations and about economy again. So as planners, we do have to have an understanding of the places, but we have to also have an understanding of some things that are harder to quantify and are harder to see. So a lot of our job is to see the unseen things. And how do we talk about that? How do we feel it? How do we talk about it and manage it in a way that is actionable? So for housing, again, we see the hardware. These are the places, all the types of housing that can be built, high rises. We can have single families, row houses, mid-rise apartments, and there's like a whole spectrum of places that can be designed. Student housing, senior housing, hotels, workforce housing, all of these kind of physical design houses. But when we talk about programs and software, we're also talking about zoning updates, inclusionary zoning to allow for affordability, lead testing to make sure that it's safe, density incentives so that more people have access to houses, historic preservation so that we're maintaining the housing stock that we do have, community benefits agreement so that any development that happens the existing community has a say in community land trusts that allow for multiple people to own a property and allow for affordability. Pathways to home ownership, making sure that first time home buyers have, have a clear path towards home ownership. These are all things that we can't see, but require just as much design in terms of how do you design policy to enable the outcomes that we want. So I, I just want you guys to walk away understanding that urban design is beautiful. It can affect people's lives in a very tangible way, but in also in an intangible way. Whatever journey you decide to take, that there's a gamut of things that you can think about and that you can do within this field. So thank you for participating in Project Pipeline, and we hope to see you again.